So I wanted to uh, jump on the whiteboard here and, and sort of bring us back to uh, what, well, we've talked about the how and the what. Uh, so now I want to talk about the, the outcomes and the, the sort of deployments that the customers do, uh, especially with the concept of, of this modern data center and data center awareness idea. So, so just to level set, you know, what, what do we sell? What is the Deterra product? Um, if you think about a uh, modern um, network, we're seeing increasingly deployed, and to be fair, I don't have to go in this mode, but this is very, very common, and, and this is where uh, customers are going. And this pen is dying. Um, we, we see com more com uh, uh, commonly a, a CLOS style uh, network, a, a leaf spine architecture. And now we have a lot of networking depth in the room. Uh, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that part of the technology. Um, but effectively, you know, you have a spine that's connected to all the leafs. Uh, so you have a, sort of a fabric, a mesh of, of uh, traffic and whatnot. And there's a lot of material online and uh, in the ethos about how this works. The, the way Deterra sees the world is we see ourselves as servers that are running in a rack. So I'll put a, uh, a D in these guys. So these are our Deterra servers. And then we're going to have compute in this same rack. Now, just to reiterate, I don't have to do this. If a customer wants to do us, put us together in a single rack, they're certainly welcome to. But that doesn't unlock all of the power that we've created. As we talked about supporting legacy infrastructure, supporting um, the modern data center infrastructure, we have this capability. I can run in either mode. We, we've designed it with a lot of flexibility so that we can meet those requirements. But the general idea is that you would have servers with storage. And, and to dovetail on that, um, not every server is a good storage server. So we talked about cost. If you're putting two flash drives that are four terabytes into your servers and you want to make them a storage server, you want to think about what you're optimizing. Because the sheet metal, the processors, the power supply are going to be much more expensive than that media. If you're putting 24 four terabyte drives in a server, you probably don't want to run a stateless application on that. Because your media cost is going to dominate that bomb. So, uh, the, the question and the comment about physics, right? That is always going to apply. But as you start thinking about what customers are trying to achieve, they want to minimize the number of SKUs they have to deploy. They want to minimize those deployments. You're still going to have flavors. You're still going to have some variation. And we see the world as storage servers and compute servers. So I don't, don't really care about what's happening here because we, we can support almost anything. But on the storage server side, that's where we partner with HPE. Uh, and other vendors to help customers put those guardrails so that they can get a proper storage server with the right amount of bandwidth, throughput, and whatnot, so they'll have a successful deployment. So we talk about storage servers deployed across these racks with the compute modules, with the compute, and then the network. I mean, this is what we sell as a software that runs on those servers, just to be very clear. It's not a hyperconverged model. There's a lot of players in that space. Uh, hyperconverged is very interesting. The customers that are interested in our technology don't want to do hyperconverge. They don't want their applications fighting for CPU cycles against their data services. They want to be able to, to change the compute at a different time scale than, uh, than they change their storage. So just a level set. We are storage software. We run on servers. We don't do uh, HCI. It's not that we can't technically. We just chose to go into market without that for today. Um, and, and this is what our technology looks like. But your, so, your software doesn't run on the same servers that run compute stuff, you're correct. saying. So the compute has to access your stuff over the network. Correct. Okay. Yeah, just to make that very, very clear. I mean, the, the other interesting thing about this architecture is fundamentally the network becomes our backplane. The network is integral to the success of our technology. So you're not running any software at all on the compute to do like immediate, like there's some vendors out there that are putting stuff literally in the compute and back-ending it to storage, you're not doing that today? No, and, and, and as Nick said, there's always trade-offs. So we decided that we were going to use standard protocol, and we were going to build a system that allowed us to orchestrate standard protocols on top of our storage infrastructure so that we could support the compute with a little less friction. So today it's iSCSI S3? 
Well, it, those are the protocols we support today. All of our magic, uh, apart from the LIO stack that, that Nick wrote, um, is really below that part of the protocol. It, it, the, the protocol, once you get past the connection to the client, has yeah. no impact on what happens internally. You can't say that about all the other systems. No, like, I know that, but if I'm, a, if I'm a, someone who's a consumer of the compute, yeah. you know, I'm, a, I'm a cloud guy, I'm a dev, I'm making containers, I don't care what's behind there. I'm just right. getting a policy, right? So my interface is S3 or iSCSI. That's what Today, I'm saying. Today, yes. That's and and, and the, the, what I'm trying to get to, the point I'm trying to make is that as new protocols become available, um, it's not trivial, but it's easy for us to onboard them. There's a lot of talk about MVME OF, MVME TCP. At some point in time, we haven't shown the UI, it's very simplistic, but uh, at some point in time, it's either, you know, when you're making the REST call, instead of you saying iSCSI, you say that, or in the UI, you click the button. Like that is the, that's how we're going to make that easy. Mm -hmm. And as 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 uh, Hal mentioned, file services, we can bring file services into this platform in a variety of different ways. Initially, it might be more uh, maybe departmental shares. Eventually, it could be dedicated or, or larger scale. Our magic is in where does the data go? How does it move? And more importantly, what happens as things change and you start adding more of these. Uh, more of these servers to run your storage infrastructure. Mm -hmm. <coughs> these couple different colors for fun here. Hopefully you guys can see this. So this is, this is our technology, like we're that, that software layer. But clearly, as we start thinking about the, uh, the sorry, I'm doing my little cheat sheet over here. Um, as we start thinking about the, the modern data center and looking at, um, For as much as I write on whiteboards, my handwriting is terrible. <laughs> um, so as much as we start talking about the, the, mo the modern data center, so moving away from, from the Deterra technology and talking about sort of the overall, uh, the overall picture, the, what we've seen is this massive uh, shift in the application space. When, when I was at Nimble uh, back in 2013, and, and Pure and, and Tintree and sort of a class of 2008 storage vendors, it was all about the flash. Like flash is gonna change storage, this is fantastic. And what's end up happening is DAS and flash have unlocked, well and also Amazon drove this too because three nines is kind of tough to deal with, um, is, is, has changed the way applications fundamentally work. Uh, Kafka was mentioned earlier. Kafka is, is the definition of what we could call cloud native application because it is expected to run in an infrastructure that is unreliable. That's really what that means. Um, you can't, well, can't is always the wrong word. You don't want to run your production ERP Oracle system on a single EC2 instance with a single EBS volume. That would be unwise for the folks that are uh, cloud experts. It is not for that. It is fantastic for spinning up Kafka instances or Cassandra or other cloud native applications. If you're going to be running traditional applications in that infrastructure, it's, you have to do a lot of thinking. And, and what we hear is a lot of companies that are, quote, cloud first um, are ending up not being able to be cloud only. And we see a lot of hybrid cloud. Yeah. Well, so one of the key differences, that maybe when you were first bringing up and chatting about this that popped in my head is one of the odd things about AWS still today is that you still specify a storage tier instance type to define what you want to consume out of AWS, right? They've got a whole tier of different storage performance and you're sort of tied to it. So scaling out and scaling up are actually still problems in terms of dealing with what workloads you want to deploy outside of building a specific environment to, to do the thing that you want to do there. It looks like you guys saw this slightly differently in terms of of being able to do that with your solution offering versus what you could do as a cloud native solution pick from AWS, for instance, or Azure. Azure has the exact same issue. You're picking up storage instance types based off of an EC2 footprint type or based off of a compute footprint type that has a particular storage configuration to match your need, need requirement. You guys are sort of abstracting away that, that side of it, so you're almost one level up from That's what right. they're providing. That's right, and so the arbitrary mapping of any storage type and then changes after the fact. Yeah, so so really the question is around Amazon has driven a behavior set. And, and they sort of said, here are your radio buttons. You can have an IO1, a GP, I uh, forget the other ones, but there's like five or six, they add more. Um, that, when we talk about application templates, 
That is the way to think about this. Those are your guardrails, right? Because in our solution, we haven't talked much about multi-tenancy, but we offer multi-tenancy capability too. So now you get into constituencies. Who are you in the organization? What are you allowed to do? At the very top level, the developers, the people that are uh, demanding the agility and driving the business, they don't care. I mean, some do, but mostly they just want all of this to work. And so an organization that adopts our technology and the way our customers are using it is they create those application templates so that they can present those, those uh, rails, if you will, to the tenants, but the tenants don't have the ability to modify the policy. Because the big difference between Amazon and operating infrastructure on-prem is that Amazon, you cannot control it. You don't have to rack a server. That's the value. When you're doing this on-prem, you have to buy it. You have to rack it. You have to plug it in. You have to figure out the networking to make it all work. The administrators have that task. And so we get into the situation of, do I build a black box where administrators have to consume what we tell them to, or, try to we, or do we build a system that is, is so flexible as we deal with hundreds of different enterprises that we can meet their specific requirements? And we've gone down the path of trying to meet their specific requirements. We give them this tooling, and how they consume it is up to them. So uh, with your current customer base, how do you see uh, customers consuming this? Uh, how do they make, uh, I guess, do they present a catalog? Do they let their developers do it? Is it the sysadmins provisioning it? Uh, how does this work in the real world? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and it, and it depends, of course, on where organizations are on the journey. The folks that are building more cloud-like infrastructure, they're the ones that are consuming the templates more and are guild, putting together that more self-service model. The ones that are <coughs> looking to get the benefit of storage on servers, um, but running legacy applications, it looks a lot more like legacy set and forget. So that's... One of the challenges that we have as a development organization and, and, a, and a product vendor is to make sure that we can meet all those requirements. So it's, it's a big task we put in front of us, but as Nick and, and Howard are talking about, we've built an underlying foundation that is super flexible and super powerful. So then it's how does that interact with the customers and how they bring their challenges and, and requirements and, and the outcomes they're looking for against that system. So, you know, as we talk about the modern data center, it's really about being API first design. And we have a nice REST Explorer so you can see everything. Um, Shalesh knows uh, intimately everything we do is API based, everything. The UI is a subset of what is in the API. Um, you know, we have the ability to deliver ro robust fault tolerance, enterprise performance while doing it in, in software. So then we start talking about this challenge of availability versus agility. And as we think about the traditional systems, when they're originally designed, the goal of the system, the procurement and operators was to not get calls on weekends. And the way they achieved that was to create a very rigid infrastructure that did not change. If you can get away with that, it's going to be more stable. Um, the challenge becomes, as you start trying to drive more uh, agility in the infrastructure to meet the requirements of the business, you lose that capability. You can't lock it down as much. That's when you need the systems to provide those safeguards. The, the systems are the ones that have to be able to uh, protect the users, allow that audit capability, so that it, it really becomes a cohesive unit as opposed to individual elements to, to deliver the, the solution. So we talk about you know, customers looking at that set and forget mentality. And, and the challenges you have when you start moving into a, a more uh, agile uh, infrastructure. It, it, thinking about traditional storage, it always came in pairs, right? If we look at this kind of design where you've got multiple racks, you know, we've talked about placement and awareness. You, you can imagine this can extend out um, <clears throat> into the, to the, the rack or, or row scale. Um, that's when our control plane becomes very powerful. We can define failure domains. We can help customers steer data and, and influence the placement within the system versus having to change their applications and change their desires to meet the, the physical infrastructure. So we start talking about agility versus uh, availability versus agility. It's really that targeted placement which sets us apart where we can choose 
precisely based on the, the placement maps and the span concept where data lives, precisely. Um, if, if in order to uh, reduce latency, you want all your media to be on flash, in the Datera architecture, I don't have to put it all on flash servers. <coughs> I can specify a policy, I can assign that policy to the application instances that says one copy flash. And through our machinery, our distri uh, distribution layer, it can bias the reads to the flash nodes. It can watch those nodes on every I.O. to see how busy they are. We can redirect them to other nodes. But this is just an example of the, the capability that we can do. So customers come to us and they say, I'm trying to modernize my data center. I want to get to more agile infrastructure, but I have legacy applications. Legacy applications fundamentally require the infrastructure to deliver reliability. New applications deliver their own reliability, and they're looking for the infrastructure to get out of the way. So we have a system that can actually do both of those things. It's a very complex problem. Yeah. So uh, clearly one of the big challenges is for people to migrate onto a platform, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a huge issue. Do you guys actually provide some sort of shim that front end systems to allow to, the migration to happen over time as opposed to something that's just magic overnight or? So, so yeah, I mean, it's moving data between storage systems is something that most customers are fairly expert at because they do this every five years. They do it every seven years. They want to do it in five, but it takes them extra years to get there. VMware customers, vMotion. It's actually simplistic. And that's why you see that explosion in storage systems and, and startups in the last 10 years because of vMotion. If I bought a Pure and I had a VNX, I can just vMotion over. So we can take advantage of that technology. Um, a lot of times, this, the, the modern data center is Greenfield. So these are new applications being spun up. Uh, customers running Oracle or MySQL, the smart ones using LVM, using ASM. So there are processes where you can bring in new drives and have the, the data services that are available in those applications or OS do the migration. I would argue most modern data centers are being built uh, in conjunction with the existing data center footprint they already have, mm -hmm. and they're, they're doing port and migrate yeah. uh, as application tiers are ready to move. Right. And, it, and it has application dependencies, there's usually business or financial justifications behind those that, that cause the move. It's not the technical people walking in and saying, we must move. It's usually, <laughs> it's usually someone else doing the motivation. So, and that's really the, the, the sort of genesis of the question because as you, as you try to do that across multiple data center sites, most people operate two, three, four, five plus mm -hmm. data center site locations and are trying to either move to cloud native first, application development, things like that. So they're going to take advantage of AWS, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the challenge becomes, okay, I've got my traditional data warehousing that I've done for years and years and years and it works really great for us, but we'd like to be able to move over onto what you guys are adopting to allow us to do some more interesting work with it. That, that seems like a very long project. Yeah, that is. I mean, I would say what we see in practice is people typically have a VMware environment and they want to be able to have an infrastructure that um, they can move some workloads, uh, stay on VMware, but at the same time hook up in Kubernetes or what have you. Right. Because um, there's a lot of shops that are looking and saying like, hey, Pivotal's great, but I want to do Kubernetes on bare metal. That's right. For performance reasons, or maybe I'm I, maybe I'm actually crazy enough. I'm putting DGXs in because I want to, you know, and and trying to get enough I/O in and out of a DGX that actually has eight cores is actually a pretty hard thing to do. Um, yeah. Uh, if if you don't actually understand that problem, it's a pretty interesting thing to sort of look into. The four core one is actually doable, but the eight core is actually pretty hard to get enough I/O in and out of it. Hmm. So those sort of structural things, I think, I think are, are the problems that many people are facing today in like the modern data center of like continuing to operate you know, on-premises yeah. footprint. Those are all file system loads also, not block. Right. Sometimes it depends. Uh, the DG, the, the, the NVIDIA DGX, stuff is usually file that's system. All, cause that's We've all, seen a lot of it. Uh, no, look, you know, it's all container based, so. It, there's a lot of variation. The majority of the tools are file based, but we are working with some customers using those technologies to drive it from a a nice SCSI perspective because we can easily move the workload around. So it's a question of how that happens. Yeah, but that's yeah. the, the, front end, back end, yeah. Right, and I think this is still an open question about that specific part. But I mean, I, that is the challenge. How do I get to the new paradigm? You know, we focus on when you get to us, you're done with that. Because the hardware itself is actually immaterial to the data. Because right. as I can move out the, as I move the data onto the new hardware, we can do rolling upgrades. All right. So okay. running a, and part of, yeah, because part, part of my question on the commodity side is if, if you made a huge investment in pure NetApp or, or one of the others as opposed to just pure commodity, like you're, set, you're now sitting on inventory that you can't use anymore on the part of the move. <laughs> no, right? but, that's, so, but that is part of the process. 
that, that they're not, we don't see people saying, I just bought a massive infrastructure based on uh, plans we had in 2015, and I'm going to throw that away and rebuild everything because it's now 2019. Like, I, I don't know if you see that, but we don't tend to see that. There, there, there is, they're very cognizant of the investments they've made, and that's part of the planning cycle is to, as they move forward, they don't want to keep buying. They want to change the next cycle. I mean, that's what we tend to see. Okay. And yeah. typically what we see driving that the change to something more modern is that the operational model for uh, the older systems becomes so painful, especially when it's across like three or four different product lines from the same vendor, that at some point the customers just say, I'm done with that model. We've seen a few cases where they completely get rid of it, but generally, you're right, it is more of a slow, a slow yeah. burn, so to speak. Yeah, so we, so we talked a lot about the policy. Um, you know, we have more material, but uh, I wish we had all day. Um, you know, the, the fundamental is that we have this concept of a template. A template is a collection of policies. The, the questions around how they get manipulated and deployed, those are fair. Those are more uh, implementation details. But our system can fundamentally manage in either, in either method. Um, I did want to talk, well, we didn't get to the layer three networking, and I know there's a lot of networking people here. Um, what's, what's unique um, about our solution is that we can participate in the layer three BGP uh, as a peer to the network. If you know Project Calico or familiar with uh, some of the techniques with Kube Router, we can do that same thing so that as we move and instantiate services across effectively a row of compute, that IP is not bound to a particular rack or location. That's a, a very common thing that we see, especially as we move to microservices, and we see an explosion of addressing, which uh, Shlesh will talk about a little bit too. So a note, a note on that, are you supporting any cast for the VIP so that localization, so like say that you have compute in a rack, uh, say three racks, and two of those racks you have compute where you want to access that data or write that data. Um, and then any cast that is available so that it never leaves the rack. But you have a third rack that's not where the data is not resident. It'll still get to the nearest. Yeah, so, so fundamentally, the presentation of the data, the protocol, is abstracted from the physical location. Like, I don't care where these things happen. Our policies direct it to try to give the best outcomes for the customer. So what you're, understand the question, we get that a lot around you know, where the data goes, but we might make decisions on data placement based on the physical infrastructure and the fault domains that might be slightly more divorced from where the compute's running. Going back to the class network, it's not a lot of hops. If you've gone here, my, the, the individual hop latency is what, three microseconds? Like this is no longer the dominant problem versus a traditional data center, the east-west model, uh, sorry, the north-south model where you got to make a trip back to core, you got to jump through a bunch of other infrastructure, that added significant latency to network transit. Yeah. So these are all things that we can support in our architecture. It just depends where customers are and, and what infrastructure they're running on top. And, and Shlesh will talk about that too. So, so maybe just to add to that, so generally the access VIPs migrate across nodes, both in the context of say a node failure event or of a, a, a service rebalancing. But there's been some cases where uh, network infrastructure doesn't support being able to move IPs across racks. And in those cases, we do have a dedicated access, access VIP per rack. And we essentially redirect the service between racks, but the IP itself doesn't. Well, so I'm, not, so I'm talking about Anycast, right? Mm -hmm. So with Anycast, the VIP then at that point is capable of existing in multiple places. Mm -hmm. So if the VIP's in multiple places, and I'm coming from in a rack, where the VIP is resident in that, but I, I also have a compute node where I need to access that VIP, but there's not, it's not being presented from that data or from those data nodes mm -hmm. in that rack because it doesn't meet the policy, so it's not resident on, in that rack, then it'll still follow the rest up to the spine at that point, not just to the top of rack. Yeah, but they're, keep, they're keeping mappings for, for, for addresses to abstractions, so they don't care about the intercast availability within the network that 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 doesn't make any difference to them. I, you yeah, guys are doing so, you're so, to, doing more like intelligent informers, information out of all like Envio and Istio, right? Or, or Istio yeah. And so Envoy in the WPA. simplest case with L2, it is sending gratuitous ARPs as the IPs move, but in L3, it completely gets rid of that if right. you have the explicit notifications. Um, but so we haven't looked at any cast, but that actually yeah. may be a good thing to look at uh, for the L2 case. 
Yeah. Because the gratuitous art piece is actually the highest amount of latency in terms of IP takeover for the host well, to reconnect. Any castle won't solve the L2 issue. Hmm. The gratuitous art is the only way to solve that. It, but it solves the L3 for localization standpoint. Hmm. So saying that if you have the data available in multiple places, then you present the, the VIP from those multiple places as well. Hmm. Then it also gives you the capability of even ECMP from um, yeah. from a rack that doesn't have the data resident to getting to other points as That's well. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in, in the iSCSI side, you know, you can have multiple IPs for a single endpoint. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you kind of get that application level, but for other types of applications where you don't have that, that would actually be really interesting. Yeah. But today, they, today we don't support it, but yeah. it, it, that can, is interesting. it raises a, a bit of a question in that iSCSI has a TCP transport. Right. So any cast, you've got the possibility of, of killing your sessions, because you're not going to be stateful across that. Mm. Uh, the probability is relatively low, but yes, that is a possibility. And by the way, you mentioned that uh, the Layer 3 stuff was unique. My research shows that it's not as unique as you think. There are other major storage vendors supporting L3 today. But, but they're not BGP peers. Updates? Yes, yes. Oh. New. Okay. It's new, but it's there. No, we've been, what, a year and a half now? Yeah. So no, we've it's been great, in production it's for great a year that you've been there. Just Unique. Unique is always a question of when other people figure out that it's important. Right. Yeah. Most of our competitors can't spell BGP. Yeah. Certainly not at, not at the SE level. Yeah. Historically, when people said L3 in storage, it just meant it had an IP header. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. We BGP peering works. You know, you got it. Yeah. yeah. yeah.